turn on the microphone. Everyone. Welcome to Beulah Baptist Church, broadcasting live from outside Lyell's, Virginia. Thank you for being here today. And it's uh, time to start the Sunday school lesson. So we're in Matthew chapter 9 this morning. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Good morning, Lord. Thanks for being with us, and please be with us as we open your word. Thank you for all you've done in your word and what you continue to do with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're in Matthew chapter uh, 9 this morning. I'm reading out of the New English Bible version this morning. Uh, let's see. And it actually, as you know, the chapter divisions, chapter and verse divisions in the Bible were not there originally. So you see a lot of stories run together, so to speak. For example, verse 1, uh, so he got in the boat and crossed over and came to his own town. That's a continuation of last week's, what John Morgan preached, uh, taught about last week. Uh, verse 34 of chapter 8, there, thereupon the whole town came out to meet Jesus when they saw him. They begged him to leave the district and go. He got in the boat, crossed over, came to his own town. Uh, own town being Capernaum, Capernaum Cap whatever. He had uh, moved there for his ministry, Capernaum. And uh, looking at uh, section or verses 1 to 8 this morning, uh, and now some men brought a paralyzed man lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. So let me pause there. Turn over to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 goes into a little bit more detail on this, this uh, miracle here. Mark chapter 2. And verse 1, uh, when after some days he returned to Capernaum, the news went about that he was at home, and such a crowd collected that the space in front of the door was not big enough to hold them. As he was proclaiming the message to him, a man was brought who was paralyzed. Four men were carrying him, but because of the crowd, they could not get him near. So they opened up the roof over the place where Jesus was, and when they had broken through, they lowered the stretcher on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, my son, your sins are forgiven. Okay, so let me pause there. So imagine the faith of A, the person that was paralyzed. He wanted to go see Jesus. Imagine the faith of the people that carried him. I mean, those are true friends. You know, a friend is somebody that will be with you throughout thick and thin, help you move or, you know, whatever the deal is. And here, these were people that four of his friends actually carried the man on a stretcher to the house. And instead of showing up and saying, well, standing room only, we can't get in. Well, that was a good try. Let's go home. They actually went on the roof of the house, tore up the roof. Now, can you imagine being in the, in the house? Jesus is talking, and all of a sudden, the ceiling starts to fall down above you. And imagine being the homeowner. You know, there's some Bible, um, some preachers have talked about this, and they actually suggested that this was Peter's house. And imagine being there and having the roof fall in. I mean, that would make you very uncomfortable, you know, if you're the homeowner and suddenly your roof starts falling in. And you're thinking, oh, boy, people are going to sue me, you know, the insurance company. Will they cover this? Well, they went on the roof, and they tore the roof apart big enough to lower the guy down in front of Jesus. Imagine the faith they had to do that. So anyway, his friends took him there, and seeing their faith, going back to Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 2, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, the man's paralyzed. Wouldn't you think, well, he needs to, um, you know, we need to take care of his physical needs. But what did Jesus do first? He took care of his spiritual needs. Because as we mentioned, uh, we we're talking um, Wednesday night at Bible study, and uh, let me put in a commercial plug. Pastor has a great Bible study Wednesday nights at 6. Uh, come on out to it. It's great. We have great discussion. And uh, anyway, we we're talking about it. The fact that everyone that Jesus raised from the dead, there were three instances, I think it was Dave Vogel mentioned this, three instances of uh, Jesus raising people from the dead. The uh, son of the widow of Nain, uh, the girl that we're going to talk to in this chapter, and um, Jairus' daughter, and also um, Lazarus. 
they all died eventually. You know, they died again. But, you know, taking care of the spiritual needs were paramount to taking care of the healing. Now, notice verse 3. At this, some of the lawyers said to themselves, where in Mark it says they thought within themselves, this is blasphemous talk. Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know, that should make you pause right there. Jesus knows what we're thinking. Well, how do we know that? Well, turn over to Matthew 12, 25. Matthew 12, 25. Uh, what was it? 12, 25. Uh, starting in verse 22. Then they brought him a man who was possessed. He was both blind and dumb, or in other words, he couldn't speak. And Jesus cured him, restoring both speech and sight. The bystanders were all amazed, and the word went round. Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, prince of devils, that the man drives the devils out. He knew what was in their minds. So he said to them, Every kingdom divided against goes to ruin. Okay, that's Matthew 12. Mark 2, 6 to 8. Well, we looked at that. Um, that's the parallel passage with this one. Uh, Jesus, uh, in verse 6, now there were some lawyers sitting there, and they thought to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? This is blasphemy. Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus knew in his own mind this is what they were thinking. And he said to them, why do you harbor thoughts like these? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your bed, and walk, but to convince you that the Son of Man has right on earth uh, to forgive sins, he turned to the paralyzed man, I say to you, stand up, take up your bed, and go home. So that's uh, in Mark. Uh, Luke 6, 6 to 8. Luke 6, 6 to 8. Um, on another day, he going to the synagogue and was teaching. There happened to be a man in the congregation whose right arm was withered. And the lawyers and Pharisees were on the watch to see whether Jesus would cure him on the Sabbath so they could find a charge to bring against him. But he knew what was in their minds and said to the man with the withered arm, get up and stand up here. Okay, Luke 7.39. Turn over a couple pages, Luke 7.39. Um, this is when, when the Pharisees had invited Jesus to eat with them and went to the Pharisee's house. That's verse 36 of Luke, uh, Luke 7. A woman who was living an immoral life in the town learned Jesus was at the table, brought in oil of myrrh and a small flask. She took her place behind him by his feet, weeping. His feet were wetted with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the myrrh. When his host, the Pharisees, saw this, he said to himself, If this fellow were a real prophet, he would know who this woman is that touches him and what sort of woman she is, a sinner. Jesus took him up and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he then gives him the parable about the person who has the two debts. And um, uh, two men were in debt to a money lender. One owed him 500 silver pieces, the other 50. As neither had anything to pay off, he let them both off. Now, who will we love him the most? Simon replied, I would think the one that was let off the most. You are right, said Jesus. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, you see this woman? I came to your house. She provided no water for my feet. In other words, he was saying, he was answering the Pharisees' uh, objections right there. Luke eleven seventeen. 17. Turn over to Luke eleven seventeen. 17. Uh, he was driving out a demon, uh, which was uh, a demon out of a man that was dumb or could not speak. When the devil had come out, the dumb man began to speak. The people were astonished, but some said it is by Beelzebub. Prince of devils, he drives the devils out. Others, by way of a test, demanded of him a sign from heaven. But he knew what was in their minds and said, every kingdom divided itself goes to ruin. So also, turn over to Isaiah 55, back in the Old Testament. Isaiah 55, 8 Verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. This is God speaking here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the very word of the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is speaking, saying, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So God knows our thoughts. 
Because remember what Jesus, a couple weeks ago, we were looking at when Jesus was talking about the various sins of a, uh, lust and hate and murder and everything else. And he was saying, but if, if in your mind, in your heart, you can see this, this is how you feel about someone. He said, that's just like committing the actual uh, sin. You know, so God knows our thoughts. And turn over, last one in this section, to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. The weapons we, uh, weak men we may be, but it's not as such that we fight our battles. The weapons we yield are not merely human, but divinely potent to demolish strongholds. We demolish uh, sophrokies uh, and all that re rears its uh, proud head against the knowledge of God. We compel every human thought to surrender in obedience to Christ, and we are prepared to punish all rebellion when once you have put yourselves in our hands. There we compel every human thought to surrender in obedience to Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to think about what Christ wants us to have. You know, the, how the world, quote unquote, out there, they want you to think a certain way, talk a certain way, and, and, uh, but Christ wants us to think about the things of heaven and God and have that influence on us. So that's what uh, we need to be thinking about, you know, and the only way to do that is getting God's word, you know, have it uh, in your mind and, and think about that. So getting back to Matthew chapter eight, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter nine, uh, verse four, but Jesus knew what they were thinking, said, why do you harbor these evil thoughts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and walk? But to convince you that the son of man, and that's a title Jesus used about himself, has the right on earth to forgive sins, he turned to the paralyzed man, stand up, take up your bed, and go home. Thereupon the man got up and went off home. The people were filled in awe at the sight and praised God for granting such authority to man. So, you know, isn't that great? You know, Jesus healed some, but again, think about the faith of the man and his friends to go see Jesus. You know, and tear up the tear up the ceiling and lower him in front of Jesus. Think about the faith they had. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get off my property! Don't you see the no trespassing sign? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, Matthew nine nine to thirteen, and he. Passed on from there, Jesus saw a man named Matthew at his seat in the custom house and said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. Uh, being in the custom house, uh, Matthew was a tax collector. And you know how we all love tax collectors. Well, they hated tax collectors back then. And you'll see that here in a minute. Verse 10. When Jesus was at table in the house, many bad characters tax gatherers and others were seated with him and his disciples. The Pharisees noted this and said to his disciples, why is it that your master eats with tax gatherers and sinners? Okay, let me pause there. We're all sinners. You know, but notice they said, you know, oh, these people are immoral. You know, they're sinners. We're all sinners. You know, what does the Bible say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, and there is none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. Uh, so the religious leaders, they thought, well, we're not sinners. We're religious leaders. We're not sinners like these people. And Jesus heard it and said, it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what the text means. I require mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to invite virtuous people, but sinners. So notice Jesus there put the Pharisees in their place. He said, go and learn what this text means. In other words, these were the, the professors of the law. They were the, the ones that knew the Torah. They knew the scriptures. And Jesus is saying, go back and read what you should already know. So that's sort of like a, uh, a uh, dig at them. And Jesus later on will say to the uh, Pharisees and scribes, have you not read? Have you not heard? You know, and reinforce to them, you ought to know this already. You know, sort of like saying, and I'm sure none of us ever said this to our children, but 
If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, or, you know, what part of no don't you understand? You know, have you ever heard that? So he, he's telling them, you know, you should already know this. Then John's disciples came to him with the question, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Jesus replied, can you expect the bridegroom's friends to go in mourning while the bridegroom is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. That will be the time for them to fast. Now, uh, Jesus himself fasted over in Matthew 4, verse 2. It says he fasted. And John's disciples had fasted to repent of sins and prepare themselves for the Messiah. Jesus insisted that fasting should be done for the right reasons. You know, and later he talks about when you fast, don't let everyone know you're fasting. You know, put on your normal clothes and uh, you know, don't go into work saying, oh, I can't have the donuts this morning because I'm fasting. You know me, I'm righteous, I'm fasting, can't have the donuts. You know, we're not to do things like that. We're not to let people know we're fasting, to call attention to ourselves. And Jesus was saying fasting should be done for the right reasons. Okay, Matthew 9, 18 to 26. Um, it's, uh, the heading is Jesus heals a bleeding woman and restores a girl to life. Okay, in um, Mark 5, 22 and Luke 8 is a uh, parallel passage of this one. And it names the president of the synagogue. His name was Jarius. In uh, Matthew, uh, it doesn't say that. It just says, even as he spoke, came a president of the synagogue who bowed low before him. But again, uh, Mark and Luke uh, name him as Jarius. And said, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So imagine the faith someone has to say, my daughter's died, but you can restore her to life. Imagine the faith that person had. Jesus rose and went with him, and so did his disciples. Then a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, for she said to herself, if I can only touch his cloak, I will be cured. Now back then, under the uh, Mosaic law, if a person had an issue of blood, uh, they were considered unclean, and they could not participate in normal activities and everything else. But this woman had faith, and she was basically saying, I'm not going to bother Jesus by interrupting his, uh, him walking, if I can just touch the cloak of his garment, I'll be healed. Look at the faith she had. But Jesus turned to, and saw her and said, take heart, my daughter, your faith has cured you. And from that moment, she recovered. Okay, so now this woman's had a medical issue for 12 years. Jesus is on the way. I don't know if you've ever really read into this, and I'm not trying to get into esoteric esoteric things but think about this this girl was 12 years old so about the time the woman started having the medical problem this little girl was born so for 12 years this woman had this medical issue and now this girl of 12 was dead so you know the same amount of time when Jesus arrived at the uh, synagogue president's house and saw the flute players and the general commotion he said be off the girl is not dead she is asleep but they only laughed at him back then they used to uh, go to the house of people and mourn and actually you could hire mourners and uh, people were you know you could hire people to mourn at a funeral and uh, so they had all these people there and jesus said uh, go away she's not dead and they only laughed at him. But when everyone had been turned out, he went in the room, took the girl by the hand, and she got up. The story became the talk of all the country around. I think that's almost an understatement. <laughs> you know, imagine the story going out about what Jesus did. So here, he had taken care of two different women, the little girl who was dead, 12 years old, and the woman had been suffering for 12 years old. And he took care of their physical needs. To show how important your loved one was and, you know, the more people you have. You know, what an impressive crowd. He must have been a great person. You know, that type of thing. I mean, because sometimes people, you know, consider, you know, look at the crowd that came out for this person's funeral. They must have been a good person. 
were loved or a great person, you know, and only five people showed up and, you know, must have been a scoundrel. I mean, that was the way they kind of thought back then. So, okay, verse 27 to 34. Here Jesus heals two blind men and a mute man. Uh, before that, turn over to Psalm 146, verse 8. We're doing a tour of the Bible this morning. Psalm 146. <laughs> if I can find it here, I got it here. The Lord restores sight to the blind and straightens backs that are bent. The Lord loves the righteous and watches over the stranger. I'll continue on. Uh, the Lord gives heart to the uh, orphan and widow, but turns the course of the wicked to their ruin. Now, actually, in verse 7, uh, the Lord feeds the hungry and sets the prisoner freed. The Lord restores sight to the blind and straightens back that are bent. Isn't that neat? The Lord takes care of our needs. So that's back in uh, Psalm 146, uh, 7 and 8. Okay, so here we go. As Jesus passed on the road, uh, Jesus was followed by two blind men who cried out, Son of David, have pity on us. And when he had gone indoors, they came to him. Jesus asked, Do you believe that I have power to do what you want? Yes, sir, they said. And he touched their eyes and said, As you have believed, so let it be. And their sight was restored. Jesus said to them sternly, See that no one hears about this. But as soon as he had gone out, they talked about him all over the countryside. Okay, why do you think Jesus didn't want people to spread what had happened? Right. It wasn't he was practicing uh, medicine without a license. It was, you know, his ministry was to preach the gospel. And, you know, the healing of people was because he had compassion on them. But if every moment he was dealing with people's needs... He wouldn't be out, you know, discipling the disciples and all that. So, and they were on their way out when a man was brought to him who was dumb or mute and possessed by a devil. The devil was cast out and the patient recovered his speech. Filled with amazement, the onlooker said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, he casts out devils by the prince of devils. So that, that was their response. They were saying, well, he can do it because he's the prince of devils. Yeah. They didn't want to give God the glory. He's doing great things, and yet they didn't want to give God the glory for what was going on. Verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9. So Jesus went around all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, announcing the good news of the kingdom and curing every kind of ailment and disease. The sight of the people moved him to pity. They were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. Uh, side note here, we talked about sheep at our Wednesday night Bible study. I encourage you to come out to the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, and said to his disciples, the crop is heavy, but laborers are scarce. You must therefore beg the owner to send laborers to harvest his crop. So um, uh, some passages say, you know, the Lord of the harvest, uh, Cry to the Lord of the harvest for uh, laborers. So Jesus urged the disciples to pray for workers. He had compassion on the people. Uh, turn over to Matthew 14, 14. Uh, when he came ashore, he saw a great crowd. His heart went out to them, and he cured those of them that were sick. So in other words, uh, another passage there. You know, Jesus cared about people and their needs. And we need to care about people. You know, um, uh, James later uh, in the uh, book of James, he talks about, you know, when someone comes up to you and, and is in need, don't just say, well, have a good day. Hope everything works out for you. You know, we're to take care of people and their needs. So any comments about this exciting chapter this morning? Yes. Yes.
Mm-hmm. Well, look at the last uh, verses of John. Uh, turn over to, well, yes, Ruth, I do. Turn over to um, uh, verse 25 of John 21. There is much else that Jesus did. If it were all to be recorded in detail, I suppose the whole world could not hold the books that would be written. So, you know, think about all the times that Jesus healed people. But, you know, he healed the blind many times in many different ways. And, uh, but remember, he, uh, the Pharisees were arguing with him after that. And he said, you know, and he was saying, I am the light of the world. And, and he's, you know, and the Pharisees eventually caught on and said, are you calling us blind? And Jesus said, the only people who are blind are those who will not see. You're blind because you will not see. And he was telling the Pharisees that. They wouldn't give God the glory. They wouldn't realize he was the Christ, the Messiah. And, uh, you know, so they, he was talking about that. There is physical blindness, but there's also spiritual blindness. And Christ came to free us from spiritual blindness, to open our eyes to the gospel and the good news. But yes, to answer your question, Ruth, right there in the last uh, verse, uh, John chapter 21. There were a lot more. Okay. Any other comments? Well, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, thank you for supporting Sunday School by either being here in person or tuning in on the uh, World Wide Web, the Internet. And thank you. We invite you to stay for our uh, service in a few minutes. And uh, thank you. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the miracles that you did. And Lord... Thank you for your compassion for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. I turned it off.